name. One, two, three. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, Open up your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 14. Uh, Romans chapter 14. Now, it's a doctrine that I'm pretty sure most of you already know about. Uh, Some of you, this might be your first time. So this teaching will fit you. And for those of you who are familiar with this doctrine, uh, there will be some new things over here as well. So don't worry about that. So there will be some new things over here for you to learn. Uh, I want to give a disclaimer that uh, some of these things is something that uh, will be uh, from what I discover. So it may not be something that, uh, that might be something new or you might not really agree with. That's perfectly fine. Uh, I believe that as Bible believers is... Uh, whatever that I, try, I find out in the scriptures and I give to you, that you're supposed to study and pray about it yourself. So that's what I want is that the people here search the scriptures themselves and pray about it. Lord leads you to not agree with it. That's perfectly fine. But overall, this message we can agree with. I can tell you that much. So uh, tonight's teaching is about the judgment seat of Christ. Judgment seat of Christ. So uh, in my opinion, so I say my opinion I think this is the most important doctrine for saved Christians. I know a lot of people, they'll talk about eternal security, and I believe that is a salient issue because a lot of wrong doctrines, it goes around eternal security. And once you believe in that doctrine, then you get into dispensationalism, spiritual circumcision, and a lot of other right doctrines. Uh, But I believe practically in our lives, the judgment seat of Christ, that's going to be important because that's all it's about is how you live every second for him. And then he'll judge you for every single deed that you've done. Right. So that is something that we have to be ready. I mean, because I just want to tell you this is that if you're spending most, you have to ask yourself this. If most of your time is spent about how to be happy In this life, uh, there's nothing wrong with that if it lines up with Scripture. But if that's where most of your focus is at, then you're practically wasting your life. You have to think about what you're going to, all the happiness that you'll get for eternity. Because all the rewards up there, which goes out for a thousand years in the millennium from the rewards that you get at the judgment seat of Christ, a thousand years is ten times your lifetime. Right. So if there's something you want to spend all your time on, it's not your video games, it's not the latest gossip out of Hollywood or the neatest toy that you can get or your own happy life. It's got to be the judgment seat of Christ. That's where your whole life is going to go towards. So I hope that today's teaching will help you. Romans chapter 14, famous passage at verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother or why dost thou set at not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So notice that the King James Bible says judgment seat of Christ, not God. If you have a modern version, and I promise I won't use a modern version today, is that it's, it will read like the judgment of God or something similar to that effect. But we have to realize it's not just a judgment of God, it's judgment seat of Christ. You might say, why? What's so important about that? Because when you talk about judgment of God then automatically people are thinking of only one judgment. Now, for some of you who don't know this, that's not true. In your Bible, there are several judgments. And I'm not going to cover this part, but uh, the easiest way that I can tell you is this, is just simply look up the word judgment. Just search word that. All right? You can even go online for free. Just search word the word judgment. And then I dare you to see if all the judgments are the same. Obviously not, right? So that's just common sense. That's just common sense. So don't think that there's only one judgment. There are obviously so many judgments in the Bible. And in our case, we're at the judgment seat of Christ, not at some final judgment of God at the end, which a lot of people make the mistake. So then you might say, well, I didn't know that. So if I'm saved, I might not go to this final judgment because I know I'm going to go to heaven. Right? In this final judgment of God, they're seeing whose name is in the book of life. And if they're lost, then they cast them into the lake of fire. So obviously, you're not going to that judgment. You're not with the lost sinners. You have a separate judgment. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. And what this judgment seat of Christ will entail will be the following. So a lot of people just don't really think about this. So 
Uh, if there's something that you want to spend your time on is think about what kind of rewards you're going to uh, get for eternity at the judgment seat of Christ. I challenge you to think of any reward that you can think of on this earth, okay, that you want. Think of any life that you want to be right now. And what you're going to find out is the judgment seat of Christ that has much more than what you can conjure up today. If you have all the world, the world is too small compared to a Bible-believing Christian who's ready for the judgment seat of Christ. And I hope that it can challenge you to do that, but also you learn something new as well. Uh, first of all, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If there are famous verses that you want to know about the judgment seat of Christ that you didn't know about, now would be a good time to know. Uh, Romans chapter 14 is one example. That's a famous passage on the judgment seat of Christ. Another passage that is famous about the judgment seat of Christ is uh, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. A lot of these go hand in hand together. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, notice that the Bible says at verse 11, Now other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now we're at verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation, notice gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. Now, this passage is talking about what kind of treasures you'll have at the judgment seat of Christ. You might say, how do you know that? It's very simple because if you look at the last part, of, uh, if you look at verse 13, it says every man's what? Work. And then it also says the day shall declare it. It's like a specific day that you're going to be judged for your work. It's pretty plain that the person's being judged for his work if you just keep reading. Verse 12 is gold, silver, precious stone. If you keep reading verse 13, the second part, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. See that? So your work is being tested, tried at this particular day. If you compare that with Romans 14, you can guess then. So this is the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, if you keep reading on, it says, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, so if his work survives, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, but notice here at verse 15, his work uh, is bad. He's got a bad work going on here. Shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. That doesn't sound like a good work, right? That sounds more like a bad work. So this bad work, he just uh, loses it. He suffers loss. Notice the last part. This is important. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. But he saved. Now, if there's a verse that's really powerful in one saved, always saved. No matter how many sins you commit in the future, that you're not going to burn in hell for it, it's this passage. Amen. Didn't we read that verse? If you read verse... 14, 15, notice, if his work is good, then he gets a reward. But if his work is bad, did it say that he's going to burn in hell or his work just suffers loss? Yeah. Right. See, so no matter what bad works you do in this life, you're not going to burn in hell. Amen. So that's a great verse that you can know that uh, the soul does not go in here. So praise the Lord for that one. Soul does not go in here. However, your work goes in here. So for some of you who don't know, that's why it doesn't make sense that work counts for your soul's salvation. Work has to be after this. See, it's separated. So it goes after this, and that's where the Lord determines your work after that. So this is when good works count here. But it's separated from the salvation of your soul. So I hope that will be very eye-opening to you and assure you of your salvation. Because let me challenge you this. If you honestly think that you can lose your salvation and you'll be judged for your sins, then how is God going to judge you for your bad work at that verse? That doesn't make sense, right? At verse 15? Then who's that talking about? You know, you have to have your bad works, the things that you messed up in your Christian walk, that has to go in the fire and burn up. So what is verse 15 talking about then? So see, it makes a lot of sense that uh, if you believe in this passage, that you can't be judged 
uh, for the bad things you've done as a saved Christian and burn in hell for eternity. Right. See, so it, it makes it impossible. Otherwise, you'd have to invalidate uh, verse 15. You have to scratch that off. Now, if we continue on here concerning about the judgment seat of Christ, we know that the first thing that you want to know is treasures at verse 12. Verse 12. So at verse 12, you'll notice that you get treasures. Now, how many of you just work so hard to get another dollar? And then some of you are fool enough to think that if you get a promotion in your job, like uh, 10, $100 extra, you think that's the greatest thing in your life. But, you know, that's not real value anyway. <laughs> it's just paper. We're talking about real worth here. Gold, silver, precious stones. Right. If there's something that you want is not a billion pieces of green paper. What you want is actually a billion of gold, silver, precious stones. See, why are you wasting your life on? What are you spending your time on? So that's the first thing. The second thing is the five crowns. So there are five crowns up in heaven. Now, we're not going to really turn to all these passages, but if some of you are not familiar, I'm going to uh, tell you the five crowns here. So the five crowns, one of them is called the crown of life. Now, the crown of life can be found at the book of James chapter 1, and you can compare that with uh, Revelation chapter 2, I think. So if you look at these two passages, the crown of life, how you get this crown, is by basically enduring trials. So then you pass the trial, you pass the temptation. If you want the cheat, the cheating version of getting this crown, then how you become uh, the cheater to get this crown is getting martyred, okay? So if you get martyred for the Lord Jesus Christ, you automatically get this crown. Why? Because they endured the trial. They overcame it. So that's the reason why a lot of the martyrs back then, they'll be getting a crown of life. And there's going to be, surprisingly, a lot of Bible-believing Christians who know more right doctrine than the martyrs, but they're not going to get this crown of life. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's something to think about, right? Uh, the second thing here... You might say, why would you say something like that? It's because simple that you might know all the right doctrines, but are you even applying? Are you even living out the word of God? Amen. I mean, did you overcome the trials or did you quit out on the Lord? See, sometimes, uh, you know, it's a sad thing, but sometimes people who know less doctrine than you, they could probably endure a trial better for the Lord than you. Amen. So that's a sad thing. Now, I believe in right doctrine. Some of you who watch me online know that I'm all for right doctrine. But sometimes you have to ask yourself this. What's the point of right doctrine? The point is so that you can know what is true in God's word and live it out. So that you can understand God's way of belief and thinking. So that you can try to follow him. What he would like. The second crown is the crown of rejoicing. You might say, how do I get that? So that can be... Uh, found And some of you could probably help me out with the verses too. If you know, then you can just call it out. All right, you don't have to feel shy about it. I think it's 1 Thessalonians 2, is that right? Or 1 Thessalonians 3? 2.19. What's, uh, what's that? 2.19. 2.19, thank you. So at chapter 2, verse 19, you get the crown of rejoicing. How do you get that? It's by winning souls. So are you out passing out tracts? Are you trying to tell people how to get saved and to go to heaven? So the second crown is the crown of rejoicing. The third crown is the crown of glory, which can be found at 1 Peter chapter 5. And when you look at that crown, it's basically where you're feeding the flock. So in other words, are you teaching? Are you preaching? Are you leading the ministry the right way? 90%, sadly, of ministers are not going to get this crown. Why? Because they compromise somewhere, So, which is sad. So you got the crown of life. You got the crown of rejoicing. You also have the crown of glory. And then another thing that uh, you want to think about concerning about the crown. I like this one. And we're going to look at the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And then uh, we're going to read verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And then we'll read verse 8. I love this verse. And the next crown is the crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness is a very easy crown to get. You might say, how do I get that crown? It's just uh, looking forward to Jesus coming. Just like the song that you sang in the hymn. We all look forward to the day when the Lord Jesus Christ will rapture us up to heaven. Amen. So it's just loving his appearance. Loving Amen. his appearance. I look forward to that day. Why? Because I look forward to a time when, uh, that I'll never hurt him again. 
that everything that I do will be right and pure in his eyes. That's what I look forward to the most. So we'll, we'll spend time reading on this one. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. You see that word, that day? Kind of matching with 1 Corinthians chapter 3, right? A specific day where it's going to show. At that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Isn't it that simple? All you have to do is just look after, look forward to the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes down for you and takes you home to heaven. That should be the easiest crown. But you know what's going to be amazing? I think, I could be wrong, but I think there's going to be a huge number of Christians who are not going to get that crown. You might say, why? Because a, um, if you were to honestly ask every person in a church, if the rapture were to happen right now, all of a sudden, bam, are you ready? A lot of them might say no, because why? My loved ones and family members, I haven't witnessed to them yet. Well, why haven't you? There are things I still need to do for the Lord. Why haven't you done those things yet? Oh, I love the world too much. That's kind of sad, right? This should be the easiest crown to get, but it's very sad. There might be a lot of Christians who might miss out on that crown. Uh, the next one is 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 25, verse 25, uh, the last crown is the incorruptible crown. The incorruptible crown. And how do you get this is basically the bottom line is self-discipline. So... Are you disciplining yourself into coming to church, reading the Bible, praying, abstaining from what is wrong? So that's the last crown, is the incorruptible crown. You'll notice that 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Bible reads at verse 25, And every man that striveth, see that? For the mastery is temperate in all things. The bottom line to that, temperate in all things, is that basically your self-control, self-trained, discipline to uh, abstain things that are wrong and to doing what's right. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So then you get five crowns. That's something. There are people here who, uh, there are literally throughout history, people who die for a stupid crown, for one crown, but you get five crowns. Throughout history, everyone wanted to be a king and some person wanted to get the crown for himself. They feel so proud. You ever seen these people so proud and happy they receive a diploma or an award? Or these celebrities, they'll cry from some golden statue like, oh, I worked so hard for this day, etc. I'm telling you what, there's something more valuable than those fake things. It's crowns right here. Amen. Crowns. That's real value here. And you get five of them too. What are you wasting your time on? Okay, open up your Bibles to the book of Luke. Open up your Bibles to the book of Luke. And another thing that people don't think about is rulership of cities. Rulership of cities. We're going to look at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Now, a lot of people, they're just happy if they have a good plot of land. Some people, it's amazing that you get uh, billionaires and millionaires people who want to run for president of the United States or people who want to become mayor or senator. And these are wealthy people. You think that they have everything, but they want something more to it than that. Why? Because they want power. They want rulership over certain territories. And I'm telling you something here is that if you're really content and happy with getting a rulership over a certain part of people in your work, a certain part in getting a huge empire ministry, your vision is too small. Uh, we're talking about rulership of cities here. That's what the Lord's going to give to you. So if you look at the book of Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, notice at verse 16, this, is, this should be encouraging. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because, look at this, this should encourage you, thou hast been faithful in a very little... Have thou authority over ten cities. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, Just over a few things. And then you get authority over ten cities there. Uh, if you look at verse 18 and 19, that should be encouraging to you. Over five cities. Really? A nicer house. A nicer plot of land. Nicer job. Uh, billionaires, millionaires. Just running for senator or president. Too small. Too small. 
And what we get down to is the inheritance. That's the big part right there. Go to Revelation uh, chapter 20. Uh, yeah, we'll go to Revelation 22. We'll go to Revelation 22. There are three passages that I want to turn to to give you more of the accuracy. So I apologize if I blocked it. So this is the wording right over here if some of you want to take a look at that. But if you look at Revelation chapter 22, uh, we're not going to turn to all the passages. But uh, you can also write down, uh, if you want to write down, but you can also look up yourself Galatians uh, chapter 5, Galatians 5. Remember, for some of you who don't know, Galatians 5 talks about the works of the flesh and then the works of the fruits of the spirit. Now, the thing is, is that if you yield to the flesh, you can lose your inheritance. That's the thing. You can lose your inheritance if you yield to the flesh, according to Galatians chapter 5. But a lot of people don't think about this. What is this inheritance? See, now, from what we look at Revelation chapter 22, you'll notice what God says concerning about the person who... Uh, overcomes and the person who lives for him and actually uh, for some of you who don't know my secret is is that I'm doing all of this purely from memory <laughs> so if I shuffle around a little bit with the verses and forgive me but I want us to look at verse 12 okay I want us to look at verse 12 the Bible says and behold I come quickly and my reward is that is with me to give every man according as his work shall be now, notice that over there. He says that when he comes down for you, he's going to bring his reward with you. And uh, actually, if you continue reading down in the passages at chapter 21 and chapter 22, is that the person who overcomes shall inherit all things. That's what it's worded as. Now, if we were to compare that with 1 Corinthians 3, that's God's intention for you, is to give you everything that he has. 1 Corinthians 3. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. That's a huge blessing is that when he gives you things uh, to inherit, it's going to be everything. Think about well, what is everything, literally everything. I really don't know all the specifics, but if God says all things and everything is yours, then he means it. I mean, we claim, I mean, just having the whole world is too small. This world is not enough. You get everything. Why? Because God owns everything and let me tell you something. He wants to give it to you. Amen. That's the creator of the universe. Everything he spoke into existence, he wants you to have that. That's something. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 21. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. And remember, Revelation would talk about that you inherit all things. Verse 22, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world... See, the world's too small. It's just a part of the list. Or life or death or things present or things to come. All are yours. Why? Because and ye are Christ's and Christ is God's. Can you imagine that? I mean, not just the world upon probably Saturn, Jupiter, Mars and constellations. I mean, we got like billions, if not trillions of stars out there. Imagine unlimited realms, unlimited worlds. And the Lord gives it all to you. What are you wasting your time on? What are you wasting your life on? Amen. I mean, this is something you want to live your life for. The most important thing that I want to get from the Lord, though, is his compliment. That's what I want the most. Is when, If you recall the book of Luke, chapter 19, it'll talk about, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So that's probably the number one thing that I want the most is basically his compliment. His compliment is what is the thing that I look forward to the most, where God will have me, uh, will basically tell me that I did a good job. Because sometimes we Christians feel like we haven't done enough of a good job, right? So sometimes you need that encouragement. You need that encouragement that the Lord says, hey, you did good enough. And you might think, I know that uh, at the judgment seat of Christ, there will be a lot of Christians who might be surprised they didn't do enough for the Lord when they thought they did. And then God will say, no, you know, you messed up here. I know that can happen, but I also believe that what can also happen, a lot of Christians might be surprised on how much they did accomplish for the Lord. Right. 
I mean, uh, that was so encouraging about the servant. You know, you've just been faithful over a little, but well done. And he gives him much more. So I want to encourage the church that, look, uh, the judgment seat of Christ, I know that a lot of people uh, have the godly fear, and you should, but don't let it overwhelm you where you have a defeatist attitude that you just keep sinning or you just don't strive more for the Lord because you feel like you haven't done enough. Look, the Lord can, uh, the Lord can use the small things Amen. for his glory. And he understands your limitations. He understands your human and your flesh. You'd be so much surprised how much God can take you miles up if you just allow him to. If you just let him. If you just let him. He'll help you. I mean, in Hebrews 12, didn't he say that his job is even if you messed up, that he'll chastise you so that you can bring forth fruit for him? I mean, that's his job. He does it out of love. He does it out of care for you. So I want to encourage you to do that. So notice that you're just wasting too much time on this earth that you don't want to waste uh, the time in. Now, there is uh, one area that I want to look at that a lot of people don't think about. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So another passage that is famous is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 concerning about the judgment seat of Christ. We also looked at other passages where it talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. And then we also looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And then we also looked at uh, James chapter... Uh, we didn't look at them, but I mentioned it briefly. We looked at... Uh, James chapter 1. A lot of the crowns that you're going to get. So all these passages and chapters that I wrote for you is basically stuff that you want to know about the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, if you feel like that you haven't done uh, enough for the Lord or you need to motivate yourself about the judgment seat of Christ, I encourage you to look at these scripture verses at home and then just read and remind yourself what it's all about. It's about Him. It's about living for him, serving him, pleasing him. Why? Because this is the only life that you got, and it's only one chance. That's it. Because, I mean, the saddest thing is you die, you go to heaven, and at the judgment seat of Christ, you get your reward, and then you can't turn back the clock. And God says, no, you're done. But Lord, you've done so much for me when you died on Calvary. I want to do something to pay you back. And God's like, no, you've had your chance. You're done. Next. You know, live for him now. I mean, especially at the times we're living in, time is so short. Time is so short. Live for him. What are you wasting your life on? Uh, when I was a teenager, I surrendered my life to the Lord at the age of 14. And thank God I didn't go down the prodigal life. You might say, why? Because I'm not better than you. No, far be it from that. It's because I had to constantly think about this. That all this is far more better than my entire lifetime living in the world to my desires. So I want you to understand that and to realize what life is all about. What life is all about. Now let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now notice this is a scary passage about the judgment seat of Christ. At verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, some people don't take note of this part at verse 10. So at verse 10, a lot of people don't take into account that the Lord, he's not just judging them for their good works. Remember 1 Corinthians 3? It's even the bad works. So you got to think about this is that when you live your life for Jesus Christ, he's not just going to recall all the good works that you did for him. He's going to recall even the bad works that you've done. So that's why your thought life should be clean. Your heart life should be clean. Uh, your living out should be clean. Why? Because God recalls it and he's going to judge you at the judgment seat of Christ for that. So, I mean, isn't that what the verse says? It, the last part of verse 10, whether it be good or bad. Now, this is where we get to one of those, uh, it partially relates to dispensationalism. And I did a video on this one. A lot of people don't think about this. So we know this is that our works are going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. It's not concerning our sins where it takes us to hell forever. So then the question comes out, and this always bothered me too, is that, well, well, well then wait a minute, then what is this referring to then? The bad works, right? 
wait a minute, if God's going to judge me for my bad works, I thought that when I got saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that was past, present, and future, and all my sins are cleared and covered under the blood. I mean, that's what we sing and shout about, amen? And I believe that too. But if the Lord Jesus Christ did that, then what is this referring to? This was the big question on my mind. And then this becomes even more enlightening. What becomes more enlightening that you never thought about before, if you're, a, if you're not a dispensationalist, is spiritual circumcision. That's the key. Look at Colossians. We're going to look at the book of Colossians. And if you look at spiritual circumcision, now keep your hand at 2 Corinthians 5. Sorry. Keep your hand at 2 Corinthians 5, but turn to Colossians. Keep your hand at 2 Corinthians 5, though, okay? You got to notice the wording in your King James Bible. And it becomes very eye-opening. If you believe every word of God, I mean, you've been ruined if you're a Bible believer. You believe every word that is pure and perfect, and then you're going to base a doctrine off of it. Oh, you extremist, you. <laughs> but it's because of that, that's why it becomes more eye-opening. If you go to Colossians chapter 2, which is very obvious, Colossians 2 is about spiritual circumcision. Right. Now, for some of you who don't know spiritual circumcision, you might say, what is that? What is spiritual circumcision? So the idea is this, is that in spiritual circumcision, uh, you know about the doctrine about uh, the fleshly nature and the spiritual nature, right? You all know that? So when you got saved, what happened is, is that uh, you are no longer the old man, the fleshly nature. You are the new man, the new nature. Because the fleshly nature is right now this body, all right? Now, this body, can we agree that it's sinful? It can commit sin. Yes, we can all agree with that. It's not something where it's pure and sinless. No, you're joking, all right? You're joking, okay? This mind can still think sinful thoughts, and then uh, this body can still perform sinful actions. The mouth that you speak out of your tongue can still commit sinful things. All right, so that's why God understands... He understands that your fleshly nature here, that the works that you do, see, out of your flesh, it's filthy rags in his sight. Why? The flesh is, uh, it tends to sin. It's weak. So God says, I have to do something. Praise the Lord. Thank God he had to do everything, right? Yeah. Not you. So what did he do? Oh, simple solution. Your God's a brilliant God. Amen. He's got to be so brilliant that... Okay, I have to have pure, sinless people up in heaven. But, you know, I have to be understanding that, you know, that they can't do it. So your God's a brilliant God. What do you do? I'll just create spiritual circumcision here. And what a brilliant idea, man. So then here's your spiritual nature inside you. And then with this spiritual nature, notice the different coloring. You know why I did the different coloring? Because what he did is that he put a boundary... He cut you off from your fleshly nature. All right? Now, let me make this simple. All right? The, who's the real you? Okay, when I say you, who's the real you? Your soul. Yeah, there you go. All right? Why is that? Because think about it. If you die, will you be in the grave? Well, if you're a Jehovah Witness, you might. All right? <laughs> yeah. so, who's the real you? It's not in the grave. The real you goes to heaven. Right. Or to hell. That's your soul, isn't it? So what does God say about you then? You, all right? You're separated from your body. That's what he says about you. Look at Colossians chapter uh, 2. The Bible says at verse, Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, in whom also ye, right? That's you. All right, that's the real you, right? What happened to you? Are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, so it's not a physical circumcision, all right? It's spiritual. So then circumcision, what is that? That's basically a bodily put it, cutting off, all right? What part of your body did he cut you off? All of it. Look at this. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That's powerful. So anything that, so another verse for eternal security. You're learning so much from this doctrine just on eternal security itself. I mean, notice here, 1 Corinthians 3, there's no way that uh, you can go to hell because he has to judge you for your bad works. But why would he do that? You know, not concerning the sins of your soul. 
So this is where the answer goes into, okay? So the answer goes like this, is that basically, let's explain spiritual circumcision real quick. So the real you is divided from your fleshly nature. So no matter what this outward body does, it does not infect the spiritual nature. Why? See that boundary line there? It's cut off. He cuts you off from that. So whatever your body sins, it's not going to hit the soul. Wait, then if you're lost and you're not saved and you don't have spiritual circumcision, doesn't it make so much sense that because your body consists of sins and commits sins, that he damns your soul to hell for eternity? Why? Because whatever your body did, it affected, it corrupted your soul. But in this case, when you get saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, he puts a boundary line. So then whatever you do in your body, it's not going to affect Amen. your soul. That's a huge blessing. But here's the thing is that then you get these people getting onto your case. Well, then you're saying that I can do whatever I want in my body and sin and abuse and I'll still go to heaven. No, God's not going to do that. What he's going to do is this, is that so this is why there are two natures. The soul is taken care of. It's separated from your body. The sins are clear. You're going to go to heaven no matter what. But then see what you do in this life, what you do in this body, can God judge you for that? Yes. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you corrupt the body, then the Lord, he's going to destroy you, he says. When you uh, do sins in your body, the Bible says the flesh reaps what it sows. And the judgment seat of Christ is the same thing. Did you notice what 2 Corinthians 5 says when you go back there? Look at verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in what? His body. See that? See, it shows here God is so fair. God is so complete. He's not going to let anybody slide, but he's going to make sure it does not contradict your soul's salvation. God is very thorough in his dealings. You serve a brilliant God. Amen. So then you might, so shouldn't that make you get worried now? I mean, no, we're not talking about a license to sin. God forbid you can live all your life wicked and sinful and get away with it if you're a saved Christian. But let me tell you this. One, uh, I don't think you can get away with it. You have to reap what you sow. Right. But even if you get away with most of those things, at the judgment seat of Christ, that's far worse. Yeah. See, God remembers. I mean, the things that you've done, the works, whether it be good or evil. I mean, isn't that what uh, Ecclesiastes 12 says? For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. See that? And then 1 Corinthians 3 told you work specifically right there. 2 Corinthians 5 told you good or bad. See that? Scripture with Scripture, it becomes more enlightening of why it says what it says. So let's look at 2 Corinthians 5 again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, Here's the big question that Bible believers discuss. And they say, what is the terror of the Lord, right? For some of you who don't know, you'll notice that verse 11, we already read verse 10. Verse 11 says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. What's the terror? The terror is from verse 10, the judgment seat of Christ. So you get terror. Now you might say, okay, what is the terror? Now, if there's a doctrine that you probably want to get into, it's not the 13th toenail of the Antichrist because you're not going to be there. If there's something you want to know, this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what you want to spend your time studying. So what is terror? So terror, I hear from a lot of different people, but I'm going to filter it down to three. All right. So I'm going to filter it down to three different opinions. All right. But there's a lot of different opinions out there. So then one is simply because of shame. The reason why is because they follow along the passage of verse 10 and verse 11, which follows logically there. Is that because of God's judging you for your failure in your works, then you get shame, and that's why you get terror. A second theory is that all you have to do is look up the word terror, and for some strange reason, terror is very close to wrath. That's pretty scary. That's pretty scary. Uh, I remember Dr. Upman once said that uh, it's not wrath. What is wrath if some of you know what that is? That's hellfire, right? So it's not wrath, it's not hell, but the word terror 
is pretty close to it. That sounds pretty close. So then I was curious, and then when I looked it up, I realized a lot of times where it talks about God's wrath on the children of Israel, for example, that a lot of times terror would accompany that as well. So that did not give me peace about that one. So that's pretty scary. But it gets even worse, all right? So this would be a good time to walk out of church. The third theory that some people would say is that you might get a beaten. So I don't know if some of you have heard that before. That some servants, uh, basically, they take it off the passage that a servant to whom is accounted much or to whom is accounted little, the one who's accounted little will be beaten with few stripes. The one who uh, is accounted more gets more stripes. And then if you follow that along with Hebrews 12, you know, God has to chastise his children. And then it says scourge along that passage. Maybe more literal than you think. All right. So that becomes scary. But I'm going to, but those are three main uh, theories and opinions that I've delved out of uh, multiple different theories. Now I'm going to tell you my theory, all right? So I'll give you my theory, all right? You're going to turn green and blue. No, I'm just kidding. So the theory is this, and I think this, is, this might be worse, all right? That's not good news. <laughs> so it might be worse than all three theories, all right? If you want to call me out for heresy, now would be a good time before you hear this part, all right? So that you don't want to hear this. I think that it has to tie with something with the first theory, basically following along the logic of verse uh, 10 and 11. 10 and 11. Because Paul says, knowing therefore, right? So therefore, following along verse 10, when he judges you for good or bad. Because of that, knowing therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So then I thought about, you know, it might have to do with shame, but it just doesn't click well with me because when I compare with the other two theories about terror, comparing scripture with scripture, that seems to have more weight. But I can't deny context either when I look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 and 11, if I have no bias. So if I have no scriptural knowledge and I just read it, I probably think the terror is referring to verse 10. Then it really dawned on me. Okay, so this is just, uh, you can just take this as theory, okay? Like I told you at the beginning, you know, just let the Lord show you. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I think it's this way. If it follows along the first theory, see, it has to do with your bad works, right? right. How you messed up in your body, and then how you failed him, and that ties to the shame. Wait a minute, go to Philippians then. Go to Philippians. We're going to turn to the book of Philippians and notice what the Bible says what happens to us if we look at chapter 3 and verse 21. Chapter 3 and verse 21. So some of you know this passage, right? What happens to us when we get raptured, when we go to heaven, is that you have a body like Jesus Christ. Now that's a huge honor, isn't, is it not? Right. The honor is to be like him. So a huge honor is to be like Jesus Christ. Think about it. Your affections, your thinking, your behavior, your everything is going to be like Jesus Christ, which is why you can't sin in heaven. That's a huge glory. That's a huge honor. God gave it to you, my friend. God gave it to you. That's a huge honor. So then verse 21 who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So then you have the body like Christ. Wait a minute then. If you have a body like Jesus Christ, what is the, to Jesus Christ, what is the worst terror to him? It's not the beating. It's not the torture. It's not shedding blood. It's about taking the dregs of sin upon himself. That's what terrified him the most. Think about it. If that's the worst torturous feeling to Jesus Christ, imagine you when God judges you for all the bad works that you did, and you have the same, right? You have the same uh, pattern after the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine all the pain and the hurt and the shame you're going to feel. That's terrifying then. That might be worse than shedding blood. So... Anyway, as I close with good news over here, <laughs> so that's why we have to take into account about the judgment seat of Christ. It's a very serious thing. It's something that you should uh, 
change your life and serve the Lord God Almighty. And then don't waste your time. My good advice is don't waste your time. Now, uh, whether uh, you agree with me with all the specifics here or not, I'm sure we can all agree in this point is that uh, the judgment seat of Christ is so important. Right. And you don't want to waste your time in your life. There's so much to lose. I mean, that verse is so true. Suffer, suffer loss at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I hope that this teaching not only was a blessing to you, uh, for first timers, you've learned something important. For people who already know this doctrine, hopefully you learn something new. And then the third thing is that I hope that everybody will take this to heart and maybe the Lord can use it to help you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, let's have every head down, every eye closed, the wife's going to the piano. I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but <clears throat> we've been talking about it a lot here lately with uh, cell phones. Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. Mm -hmm. And listen now, I, Brother Kim is on YouTube. I uh -huh. was on YouTube for a while, may get back on it. We're broadcasting on YouTube now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with watching his stuff material. Nothing wrong with watching others on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I'm for it. Sure. But watching Brother Kim on YouTube or listening to some preacher preach or so that's not spending time with the Lord. That's good. I get caught up sometimes in thinking, well, you know, I was in church all week or I was in a meeting all week. And, you know, I mean, I'm even the one preaching, you know. Uh, I just, I don't have to take as much time by myself. No, in fact, when you're in the busiest, that's when you have to make sure you're taking as much time with the Lord. Because we get so caught up in day-to-day -day life, we forget that one day we'll stand before the Lord at the judgment seat. And are you living your life for the judgment seat? I'm going to pray. Mike's going to begin to play. We're not going to tarry long. If you don't come, we'll close out. But if you need to come, I invite you to come. Father, I pray you help us now to live every moment in light of the judgment seat of Christ. The day when we'll stand before you. And we will give an account for what we've done. We will give an account for the time we've spent. Either doing things for you or simply wasting it. So Father, help us tonight and make some eternal decisions in Jesus' name. Amen. Some have come. If you need to come tonight, why don't you just come and you slip out of your seat and pray.